<laughs> Welcome everybody to the Dig For, the Celebrate YouTube live series. I am hosting today, Heather Mahalik, and with me I have Patrick Seward, and we want to talk about something a little bit different. I know this has only been two episodes of the show, but what we want to talk about today is ethics. So ethics in forensics, um, no matter who you work for, what you do, I'm a firm believer that the data should speak for itself. Um, many of you probably don't know my background in cases I've worked. So Patrick and I do have some things in common here and there, but I have a list of questions that I have kind of cleared with Patrick and then some surprise questions that are more fun, not to catch anyone off guard. So Patrick, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. So first question, talking about ethics, and this is super important and you can steer this question either way that you want to, but from your point of view, whether it's public sector or private sector, how does ethics differ or how is it similar? I don't really think the ethical practice of digital forensics differs all that much between public and private. Um, you know, in obviously in the public sector, you've got a lot of law enforcement, government contractors, things like that. Uh, the, the, the governing principles that we operate under as practitioners think the really shouldn't practice. change whether you're working for the government, uh, you know, i.e. for the good guys or working for, uh, you know, for, for essentially on a contract basis uh, for for uh, for somebody who's hired you. You know, at the end of the day, what we all have to do is, is adhere to uh, certain principles and standards that when we present the evidence in court, eventually, that's the, that's the whole basis for what we do, uh, that there, there should be no questions. Now, the problem is, we run into instances where I think the, 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 the data does speak for itself, but then some people try to have a little bit of bias about it, about what the data could be showing. And I think that's where the, the ethics start to get a little bit fuzzy. And that's a tough one. I find I would be lying to you if I said I have never worked a case assuming I knew what the data should say to me. And I think a lot of people, you almost have to take your heart out of it and leave your conscience to the side and just let the data and obviously validate the data. That's another thing that drives me crazy is when people don't validate, <laughs> but you have to approach it with an open mind and it's easier said than done. And I know in a lot of child exploitation cases I've worked or terrorism cases, like you are in the mindset that that person has done it and you really have to check almost a gut check of that. Yeah. You know, I think the guiding principle to me is objectivity, right? If we are objective when we approach the evidence uh, in all forms, and we are approaching it from, you know, uh, Covey says, keep the end, of, begin with the end in mind. So if we begin with the end in mind, the end being presenting the truth, not necessarily that person A is guilty or person B is innocent, um, but that we begin with presenting the truth, and that truth is our is our kind of lightning rod with regard to that, our north star. I think I think that's really the place to approach it for. As you said before, though, it's not always easy, right? I've, I've worked child exploitation cases where I know the guy was super guilty. Uh, and so in the evidence all points to him being super guilty. And then you get another expert in and, and maybe they point out something that you weren't aware of before. They kind of open the, 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 uh, the horizon a little bit to maybe some timeline analysis or some things that, that, that help to mitigate that guilt a little bit. So, uh, you know, we're all human. So, when we approach it from an ethical standpoint that humanity can also creep in as well. We all want bad. And look, I don't care who you work for. If you're, if you're going to sit here in front of me as far as, as a, as a, uh, as a digital forensic expert and say, I want the bad guys to go free, then you're not only a bad person, <laughs> but you're probably lying or, 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 or grandstanding. Um, nobody wants the bad guys to go free. Uh, and you know, I think, I think it's sometimes, defense experts, I call them independent experts, but defense experts get maligned because, well, they're just helping out the bad guys. Yeah. No, we're really actually just trying to help drill down to the truth, which isn't always presented to us from the other side. Yeah, and honestly, the whole like protect innocent, that could also be the suspect. The suspect Absolutely. could be innocent of the crime. And I joke often when I teach, if someone ever gets my phone, I would worry because most people press buttons and get answers. And it would maybe make you look guilty. Absolutely. I mean, you know, especially in the day and age of push button forensics, where it's like, hey, let's 
let's just click the button and get the evidence presented yep. to us and and uh, and there it is and take it at face value I, I you know in talking with other colleagues particularly in the private sector um i've seen repeatedly where that that evidence that's presented to us at face value there's a lot more that goes into it than that and that goes back to your validation piece right uh there's a lot more that goes into it than that and looking at it sort of holistically the big picture can certainly benefit everyone in the case i would i would like to think and i and i do believe because i still have tons of friends in law enforcement i teach law enforcement all over the country uh i like to believe that uh that the that the good guys don't want somebody innocent going to prison too right Agreed. but there's a there's a lot of factors that go into whether or not that that actually happens uh that some of which are not within our control yeah and you know i will give some credit to i won't name anything but matt gecko and i wrote a blog several years ago on like Bluetooth and iOS and how to do connections. But a law enforcement officer reached out to me saying the difference of a prison sentence, UTC minus five was everything. Like the accident was five hours prior. So just proving that, but they wanted to take it to that level instead of just guessing. So I think that's so important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I also preach, yeah, I do a lot of call detail records analysis, which of course is kind of an offshoot of, of, of digital forensics, but I preach all the time that the devil's in the details, right? Yep. Um, if we don't drill down into the details with many uh, cellular records cases, we're not doing our clients a service. And, uh, and, and really on the flip side, on the government side, if they're not drilling down to it and, and presenting it in a reasonable manner, then they're not doing the, the people a service. Yeah. And you know what, Ryan Salmon, I assume that's Ryan S on YouTube Live right now, is saying that sometimes he finds it he wants to work harder if he starts finding exculpatory data. <laughs> and that's what even well, sometimes the dark pieces can be of interest. When you find something, it's almost putting yourself in the mindset of the criminal. That's something I do that may make me sound insane. But what would you do if you had committed that crime? And then when it's the opposite that you find, it can be really interesting to pull that thread as well. Well, I'll tell you, it's funny that he says that because I tell most of the defense attorneys that hire me, particularly in like CSAM cases, right? Uh, I tell most of the defense attorneys, I'm going to work to prove your guy guilty. I'm going to I'm going to work to to look for the evidence that's going to look the worst and then yep. expand out from there to see what what the bigger picture may show. Uh, and and frankly, if they look at me and say, well, I don't want to hire you in my case, if you're going to look to find then they only listen to part of what I said. Right. Um, and, and I probably don't want to work for them either. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting that we're two different sides, if you will, approaching it from kind of the same position. Exactly. So here's a random question, just to clarify for anyone that's listening that may not know, define public versus private sector. So people kind of understand which groups people fall into. Uh, I would define public sector as anyone essentially being paid by the government, law enforcement, government contractors, um, you know, uh, any, any of your analysts that are working for any of the three letter agencies, all those types of things. Uh, the private sector, I would say, is is, is for higher digital forensics. Um, you know, most of the cases that we work are all either civil litigation or criminal defense. We do have some prosecution cases that we work as well. Uh, so but we're essentially hired to work uh, by a private entity or, or appointed by the court to work to work the case. Um, now there is some overlap there, right? Like I already said, I, I I work several cases with the prosecution. There are uh, companies like ours that will get hired by governmental agencies to work cases. Mm -hmm. So there there can be some overlap and some kind of fuzzy fuzzy ground there. But generally speaking, that's how I would define it. Okay. So assuming based upon that, you have supported both sides, correct? Yes. Okay. I have as well, and I don't think a lot of people realize this. I actually even back in the day. I think it was like 2007, I was asked to like revoke my membership from a professional organization because I supported one defense case. And yeah. you know, I'm a quiet person, so I didn't cause a stink at all. <laughs> but it, it's interesting because that same organization I am now going to be keynoting for. So it's funny how things in the past, there was such a stigma on anyone who supported a defense case. And at the time I worked at Strauss Friedberg and we took a pro bono case and I was against it. I'm not going to lie. I'll be honest with you. I did not want to work this rape case because I made assumptions that he had done it. Um, I worked the female's computer and kind of put myself in that mindset and then started finding weird things. And it's kind of like I like Ryan. I found something that just didn't make sense. And then ultimately it turned into 
finding out that he actually didn't do it. Right. So I felt like I had to apologize, but just because I did that and the person was found not guilty, I was still kicked out of an organization. But now I'm back in it. I have that case behind me. So I think people are really growing and understanding like the data is the data. And yep. the job I love that you said you will tell people, I'm going to try to find your client guilty because you're trying to get into the mindset of the person you're going to go against. Right. So find all Absolutely. the dirty details before someone questions you and you're stuck. Yep. Well, it's interesting you mentioned about support between, you know, from both sides. I will tell you that my, the, the level of, um, what's the word I want, cooperation that I get when I work a, a uh, criminal defense case versus a criminal prosecution case is different. I mean, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and say they're the same. Uh, but generally speaking, we get to where we need to be as far as the cooperation and the data that's provided and everything that we need to get to get at the truth. Uh, it just may take a little bit longer. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It always seems to take a little bit longer, right? <laughs> <laughs> every, every, nothing takes as long as ever. I think I ever think uh -huh. it's going to take. So, Okay, so here's another question for you. What do you recommend to someone when they know ethics is being violated? So what That's a darn do? good question. That's a really good question. Now, it, internally, if I thought that we were violating any internal ethics, I would probably take it to, to one of our managing directors or our CEO or something like that. Um, it's, a, it's a weird place to be when you're working, let's say, a criminal defense case and you know that there's an ethical violation on the other side. That's a weird place to be. And that's when I usually have a pretty difficult conversation with the defense attorney who's, who's working with me uh, because mm, <laughs> that could be used at trial. You know, that could be a, a gotcha moment at, at trial or during a hearing or something like that. It could also be brought up pre-trial. Um, most reputable defense attorneys I've seen won't do the gotcha thing. OK, but uh, but some of them will. And so. When you when you run across those things, it kind of depends on on from what angle you're approaching it. If it were something that was internally, certainly I would bring it up uh, internally and probably have a hard conversation with that with that examiner. I mean, uh, I can't believe I'm saying this. I'm kind of in a supervisory role now. I've got 60 some odd cases underneath me and a lot of people working them. So if anything like that popped up, I would I would certainly address it myself. And then and then we'd have a probably a, a harder conversation up the chain a little bit. Yeah. And I don't want people to think it can only happen in a criminal defense aspect because when I started my career, I was kind of pushed into a situation. It was a child exploitation case and the user only had thumbnails on their desktop. And my manager at the time wanted me to report it in a different way. So he wanted me to enlarge the images so that they could be seen in a better view. And I had issues with this because I was modifying evidence to make it look bigger then the person actually saw it. And I was trying, it's hard when you're trying to explain a request like that to a non-technical person as well, or when prosecutors get involved, or if you have attorneys involved and you're trying to explain why you can't modify something to make it look better, because it would be better to support their case, but it's not how the evidence was seen. Right. So I, ha I struggle with that. Still to this day, that kind of haunts me. And I think I was 23 years old. I run across a lot of cases where the evidence is presented to me in such a manner to paint a narrative. Now, we're all going to be painting a narrative to some degree. Hopefully, again, the truth is the lightning rod about that narrative. But I don't appreciate it when I get a report from uh, an, an expert opposing my case. And let's say it's a call detail records thing. Again, that's just what I'm working a lot of these days. And uh, instead of showing that my guy was at a, a location of interest over a short period of time, they show records spanning 24 or 36 hours, uh, uh, you know, in one slide showing that, showing that illustration. Well, that's not, it's not really, uh, adhering to the truth. He was in and out of that area for an extended period of time. So it's not like he was right there during the time of the crime. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's again, kind of painting a narrative with your analysis. And, um, I don't, I, when I see that, it sort of rubs me the wrong way, to be honest with you, because, again, it's it, it's not lying, but it's also not 100 percent the truth either. Right. Yeah, exactly. Completely. So there's an our chat is wild today. This is fantastic. <laughs> there is a question. I'm not going to say the name just because of the content of the question. So this person is considering hiring an expert. Their concern is the person was forced to resign from law enforcement for bad behavior. Would you say that's a credibility concern or an ethical one? Uh, I'd say it's a credibility concern. Um, the, 
the thing, you know, there's all sorts of circumstances that can go into that. And, and there's all sorts of um, perspectives that can go into that. Uh, I would say, ultimately, if that, if that expert has retained their professional integrity, that's really at the crux of it, right? Um, because that's all we have. Ultimately, that's all we have is our professional yeah. integrity. Yeah, I agree. And a lot of people are chiming in with that, too. And yep. then Kevin chimed in as well, saying weird ethics have appeared in corporate, too. So it's honestly everywhere. It and is. that's where you have to protect yourself. So that leads into the next question. For anyone that is new or for those of us who are seasoned, what do you think ethics of the future looks like in DFIR? That's a really good question. I, one of the things that is really interesting and also a little bit scary if you think about it about our industry is that there isn't a ton of governance over it, right? There's governance over uh, best practices. There's governance over, uh, you know, like NIST and SWEDGE, and you know, they all have some sort of governance. But really, there's no real governing body that says if you violate the ethics of the practice of in the practice of digital forensics, then you're going to be ousted from the practice of like there is with medical experts, yeah. for instance. Um, so while I'm not a huge fan of overregulation and over policing, if you will, I I do think that eventually we're going to have to get to a place because there's a lot of people coming out of college with digital forensics degrees, a lot of people getting hired in the industry because it's, it's blowing up. Um, we're going to have to get to a place where there's some sort of governing body, a, a board, you know, almost like a board certified digital forensic uh, expert where uh, if, you know, if they're board certified, they're governed by the board and the ethics by the board and, and all those types of things. Um, because it, if, if we just kind of, throw up the cards and let the chips fall where they may, then uh, I'm not sure it's ultimately going to be in the best interest of our industry, unfortunately. I agree. And I feel like we're starting to see a little bit of a flare up of people being hired as experts and just saying what they want and kind of tarnishing everything we've all worked so hard for. So we do have to protect it. Yeah, I call them the hired guns. Uh, they're everywhere, unfortunately. Um, I've had exchanges with some of them, probably on LinkedIn and elsewhere. But uh but, you know, it's it, I, there are higher guns in law enforcement. There are higher guns in the yeah. private and public sector. You know, they're, they're everywhere. Uh, so it's just a matter – it's kind of the, the vigilance thing, right? As, as professionals in the industry, we have to be vigilant to kind of push against that. We're applicable and in a professional manner. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Paul's chiming in saying it can definitely create some strange and bad case law. <laughs> yes. It's so uh, And, you know – I hate the term junk science uh, because it gets bandied about quite a bit over, you know, because of, of through a number of different topics within our industry. And once it's once it's thrown out there, usually one side or the other latches onto it for one reason or another, and then it tarnishes that practice going forward. And um, I think that's unfair and it's also inaccurate. Uh, and I think a lot of people throw it out. Not a lot. Several people throw it out frequently just because it serves them. And um, I'm not about being self-serving. I'm about helping our, out our clients and oh, again, getting to the truth as much as possible. Absolutely, that's super, super important. All right, I have a random question for you now. Sure. And it does not have to be forensic related in any way. What is something you wish you knew 10 years ago? <laughs> uh, that's a darn good question too. Um, you know, let's see, what is this, 2023? <laughs> Uh, so I'll, I'll tell a little, a short little tale. When I first got into digital forensics, when I was in law enforcement, I was, I went through uh, B-cert and uh, SCURS and all that, so all the computer related stuff. And somewhere along the way, they came to me and said, Hey, Patrick, you want to go to, uh, you want to go to mobile forensic training? I said, nah, I don't need that. What am I going to use that for? I don't need to get into phones. Well, that was probably about 10 years ago, 10 or 11 years ago. And, um, yeah, I wish I had I had, I had taken a, a left turn at that and probably had a little bit more foresight. I've of course since gotten very well uh, trained up on it, but uh, that was one of the things that they when they came to me, it's like, wow, that was that was one of those you, you hit the road and there's a there's two turns you could make and I didn't make the right turn. So yep, you know what? I joke about my mobile experience that I don't know if I was in the right place at the wrong time or what <laughs> happened, but I left Strauss Freeberg and joined Brian Carrier and actually Andrew Hogue just made a comment, Andrew was my godfather of Android. He taught me everything I knew about Android, when to stop, when to take a step back, when to call him for help. But it's <laughs> it's crazy 
to think like if we only did one thing different, but look where you are now. So it's gone really well for you. Yeah. Knock on wood. I can't complain. And I want to leave. So this is a question and I feel like this is a deep thought question, but Andrew is asking this and he says, um, we don't deeply validate our tools, data and completely completeness. He thinks we're at great risk in this area, which I agree. Do you think the industry can make it sustained investment in doing this? Like, and if not, what are the implications? So I think things like the deeper peer review, us continuing training, research, playing and capture the flags, things like that to keep yourself intelligent and almost not pointing a finger, but finding those hired guns that are just out there to press buttons, get answers and make money because that is going to hurt our careers, I think. I agree. Um, the problem the problem that I have, and I, I, I know I'm not the only one with this problem, is time. Yeah. Right? All those things take a fair amount of time. And and it's I'll go back to the doctor analogy. Uh, you know, physicians have to keep keep up with medicine and current trends and all those types of things, and so do we. Um, but it seems like there's such a mountain of stuff out there that that is piled. I mean, for a while, I, f I feel like there were 16 webinars a month, and I'm like, I can't watch all these. I actually have to make a living, you know. Yeah. Um, but so there's a there's a balance there. But I certainly agree that uh, those the certain aspects of, of what was brought up in that question, like tool validate, you know, validation and and, uh, and and kind of doing the back end work to make sure the foundation is solid. Uh, I think those are super important. And if we start to let them go as an industry, if we start to let it's not even us letting them go as an industry. It just starts to happen. It's it's almost insidious. Like it's it just starts to happen, and then it just is let go, and nobody calls anybody on it. Um, so if if that starts to happen, I agree with you that it's not going to be it's not going to be good overall for our industry. And so we need to again the village the vigilance part creeps in. Absolutely, trust but verify. Exactly, it's my platform that I've always stood on. <laughs> Patrick, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks, Heather. I really appreciate the opportunity. It's a great conversation. It was fantastic speaking with you. Thank you.